Speaking of watch this space, our, um, our, our guest for this week is a fellow Sly blogger that I mentioned earlier. His name is David Winter, and he's a very uh, talented invertebrate biologist. And we sat down with him and had a good old chat about the life and times of a PhD student and where he's going to go from here. So welcome, David. Hey, thanks very much. David's just completed his thesis, or just rather handed in his thesis. So first things first, how does it feel, David? It mainly feels strange, I have to say. I um, I handed in two days before I headed to the North Island for some summer holiday, some Christmas holiday, and yes, I've just mainly been walking around wondering what to do with myself at the point. And David, this is your PhD thesis, yeah? Yeah, that's right, Cool. Cool. How, how long yeah. has it taken you? It's not a very polite question to ask. No, it's um, <coughs> a little bit more than the three years that it says on the tin, but uh, okay. a lot of my life, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I know I know the feeling. <laughs> so so talk to us a little bit about what what you've previously referred to as the horrors of preparing a thesis. Well, <laughs> yes, I have indeed. Um, well, I don't, it's not actually a horrible experience from start to finish. I I just really enjoyed my time doing the research and doing the lab work and doing the field work for it. But um, I personally found the writing up process just a, an absolute nightmare in terms of. Um, sitting there and sort of thinking of what a reviewer or what a marker might be thinking about every sentence that I was writing and then trying to live inside that person's head while I was writing I did not enjoy it even a little bit but I got to the end So what was your thesis about then David? What would you say? Snails So it was a, in particular a group of snails from Rarotonga which is a small island in the Cook Islands uh, basically isolated from any other large and kind of ecologically diverse island. And uh, we studied one little group of snails from those islands and found kind of a surprising diversity, I guess you would say, for such a small island. Um, there's a large number of species. And I have to be just a little bit coy about talking about it because um, we actually haven't published most of the results out of my thesis yet, which is not the usual way you would go about um, going, through your, going through your thesis, but some kind of interesting things popped up in, our, in, the, in the process of doing it. Um, so, what is my so you said a spri- surprising diversity, right? Yeah, yeah. So is, is this kind of, are we talking something like Darwinian Galapagos finches kind of diversity, or are we talking that some were blue and some were red? <laughs> some, some are pink. Um, <laughs> Even better. Galapagos finches actually going to get me started on a complete sidetrack here, but uh, I'm not as diverse as all that. And calling them Darwinian is a, is a little bit um, a little bit kind to Darwin, who really had no idea what was going on with the Galapagos finches mm. until he showed them to um, Gould, to a to a ornithologist back in England. Somehow that kind of the myth has grown that Darwin got to the Galapagos, looked at some finches, and said, "Aha!" Um, but kind of none of that's true. So, actually, the question that you actually asked me was about snails, and um, yeah, so the thing is that they're morphologically only a little bit diverse. Uh, there's things that we can see about them, but then when we look at the genes, we can actually prove that these things are morphologically quite similar to each other, but distinct. Like we can look at a particular character and say they're different. Um, when we look, then look at the genes, we can say that in fact these things are different species. So how do you how do you do that from a geeky physics standpoint? I have absolutely no idea how you look at the genes of an organism and say, oh, okay, well, this is distinct from this. I mean... Well, yeah, this is kind of starts with a philosophical problem, right? So the hardest question and the one that we try and make um, second and third year zoology and genetic students answer, and to various degrees they succeed in doing that, is what is a species, right? Mm. And you could spend an entire podcast talking about that and end up with no results. <laughs> and taxonomists just love arguing, basically, as far as I can tell. And... I think um, John Wilkins, who has a blog, Evolving Thoughts, which everyone should read all the time, is a philosopher of biology, and he listed, I think, 26 different concepts of species which exist out there in the world that someone actually wants to defend as being the way we should define species. Gosh. Um, Wow. But I have a party political broadcast here. I have kind of a position that I think is the right one, and that is species are populations which are capable of evolving apart from each other. And most of the things that we think of as being definitions of species, so if you've done single form biology, 
or what the young people call year 13, biology and tech. Um, you know about... Young Booker Snapper. <laughs> exactly. There's so much stick from the, the second and third years now when I start talking about physical math that they have to do. But if you've done uh, year 13 biology, you'll know about the biological species concept, right, which is the idea that a species can produce fertile, or individuals can produce fertile offspring when they're part of a species, right? They're part of one species, they're the same species. So people get carried away about these ideas that that's the definition of species, but in fact we can hybridize. Humans hybridize with Neanderthals, one of the most exciting results of last year, I would say, of, in terms of evolutionary genetics, is clear evidence that our ancestors hybridized with Neanderthals when they met each other over many hundred thousand years ago. So it's clear that species can occasionally hybridize, but keep on evolving apart from each other. So if you say that that's actually the definition of species, then all these things that we thought of as um, concepts, species concepts, are actually just tools that we can use to try and understand it. So we should look at a particular case at a particular time and know what tools we have and say, well, how do we know if these things are actually evolving apart from each other? And one of the obvious ones is genetics, because once populations are apart from each other, changes in one population don't affect changes in the other population. And as these genetic changes accrue, you can start actually using statistical tools to try and calculate how probable the differences that you see are if there's been a history of speciation for generational new species or if there hasn't. Fantastic. That's an excellent description. I've seldom heard the species problem described so eloquently. I'm, I'm just saying that because now I feel like I understand it, well, which yeah. is a new feeling for me. <laughs> well, this is a dangerous thing, though, right? If one guy, because that is a party political position, and there's probably people that would disagree with that. And if you have one guy who is, just sounds confident, it's easy to sway you. So you should, people uh, that are interested in that should definitely read up. Um, John Wilson's blog would be the best place to start in terms of what, sort of arguments people make against those ideas, etc. So I guess the big question that comes out of this is, did you find that the populations of snails were species? <laughs> yeah, we think they are. The ones that we looked at, um, we have good genetic and morphological evidence now. I think that they are different species and they'll, in time, they'll get their own names and all that sort of stuff. And the Cook Island government will hate me for giving them a whole bunch more things that they have to uh, conserve. <laughs> but the greenies will love you, and that's the important <laughs> thing. Indeed. So what are you doing now that, that you finished this? Well, well, that you've handed it in. So what are the next steps? What are you going to be doing with your time? Uh, well, as I said, the first thing I did, having submitted my thesis, is wander around the walls and wondering what I should be doing with my life. Uh, but... <laughs> I'm in uh, Masterton now, my uh, ancestral homeland, uh, for another week or so of holiday, and then I'll be back into it in Dunedin, and I'm actually, horrifyingly differently for me, going to be working on a vertebrate, working on um, some freshwater fish galaxies, which are the fish most famous in New Zealand for making up white bait, um, and some of their relatives, and working on a project that's already going on um, about these things, and they need a geek. And I am as big a geek as you can get, so I'm going to work on that for a little while. That's wonderful. So I, I guess this tails in, but, but why did you initially end up studying invertebrates, and why now the change possibly to looking at vertebrates? Uh, well, the change is because that's where the money is. Fair and enough. You're a scientist that <laughs> that's always going to be part of determining what you do with your life. I think. Mm. Uh, but no, I'm an invertebrate evangelist um, because... There's just so many invertebrates in the world, and if you ask someone on the street to name ten animals, I bet you'll get sort of lion, a tiger, and a, lions and tigers and bears and sharks and maybe sort of a few birds or something. And those are all vertebrates, and that's great. But there's you know a few thousand species of vertebrates and probably ten million species on Earth. So if you're only thinking about fuzzy things and cute things, well actually I think invertebrates are cute, but perhaps I'm strange in that. Um, yeah. And you're getting kind of a slanted view on the way. You well, the way the world works, basically. So I try and try in my own little way to try and just bump up and put a bit every now and again and get them into the consciousness. Awesome. Yeah, I think my favorite term for all the, the sort of big, shiny, fluffies like the pandas and the tigers and things is charismatic megafauna. Well, I don't know. I think a lot of them are, are, are pretty cool. And last time I checked... Um, 
uh, octopi or octopods, in fact, are, are also invertebrates, which means that I will love invertebrates always. <laughs> <laughs> okay, brilliant. David, uh, you recently had uh, one of your posts or something uh, published in the Open Lab, correct? Yeah, so the post I wrote about now is from the Pacific Islands, I think. Um, which, yeah, is picked up by this um, anthology which gets made every year called The Open Lab, which is 50 posts of good science writing from the web. It's not the best because it has to be made into an anthology and that process means some very good posts which maybe are in fields that are overrepresented kind of yeah. get pushed out, etc. So it's not necessarily the best 50 posts, but it's 50 posts which are a sample of good science writing and absolutely thrilled to say that my post on Partulas, which is a land snail group um, from the Society Islands, which are now almost all the thing, um, made the cut for that. So yeah, it's really cool. Cool. Well, we'll certainly make sure that we uh, link link to that post in the um, the TOS blog post that goes with this podcast so that people yep. can go and read it and possibly go and buy Open Lab because they're really, really sort of, um, I think, very reasonably priced for the amount of awesome that they are. Indeed. And it's cr- a great sample of across, as I say, it's across the field and some of the, some of the parts of science which perhaps aren't as well represented in the way most people read science on the web, sort of physics. And chemistry is included in this sort of more, I don't know what you'd describe it, but well, there's poetry and there's more sorts of um, reflective writing and it's really interesting. Excellent. Well, we'll definitely go and check it out then. Also, well, that's, that's, that really is now all the questions that I've got. Uh, Alfred, I have one more. Awesome. Yes, I have one more. David, so, so you're telling us that the, the, the reason you got involved with what you do is because you kind of... It's great. It's quite altruistic, kind of standing up for the little guy that can't stand up because he has no skeleton. <laughs> um, how did you get from there to studying Rarotongan snails from... Where, oh, yeah. where, where are you? Where do you work? Down, Down south? Otago, yeah. Otago. Um, I was so, absurdly lucky. Um, when I started my honours project, my supervisor, Hamish Spencer, who just finished being the head of department in zoology down in Otago, um, had a collaborator, had given them these snails that might be something interesting and, you know, throw them to some honest student for a waste of time project for them and if there is something interesting, great. If there's not, we haven't really, you know, spent any real um, resources. And that was kind of the start. The, the first thing that there really was something going on with that. And so I got to pick it up as my PhD project. So, yes, I was just extraordinarily lucky that it's... Um, well, I think a very cool project. I know I have to be slightly boring by being coy about not talking about the details, but once they're out in papers, I'll definitely be writing blog posts about them and trying to tempt these snails, which I think are pretty cool. And yeah. <laughs> it sounds like an amazing story. We'll have to get you back on when you're um, capable, when you're released <laughs> to tell the whole tale. Oh, exactly, yeah. It'll, it, it, I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, trail of discovery. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> a I couldn't help trail. myself. <laughs> oh, God, no, we're not going there. Um, yeah, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David, such. It's always wonderful chatting with our bloggers, particularly when they've been getting up to your levels of, of, of uh, awesome. Oh, well, it was a real pleasure. And we'll speak soon. <laughs> cool. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, and uh, with that, I guess we'll uh, just chat about sort of any upcoming events this week and then probably uh, close off the podcast. As always, please do check out the blog post that accompanies this, cyblogs.co.nz forward slash task. Feel free to rate us on iTunes as well, but we'll cover more of that shortly. Um, Of events this week, um, I I don't know what you know about. The only thing that I'm aware of is at uh, VUW, and it's a lecture at, uh, sorry, it's actually a lecture at Wellington Rutherford House on Friday. Uh, What causes obesity? An alternative view by Professor John Tomer. Um, Unfortunately, the Vic website is down, so I can't see much more about it. (laughs) But it does look interesting. It does. Yeah. (laughs) And again, We'll, we'll link to the uh, to the event post on the TOSP blog if you want to take a look. Absolutely. Anything else? Off, I believe you had a small plug that you wanted to chuck in this week. Oh, there's two actually. Ah. The first one is the first one goes to an event that if we had TOSPed last week, yes, that is the correct past tense of TOSP 
thing um, I would have mentioned. So there was a gorgeous uh, comet that was visible in our skies at the end of December. It was called the, the Lovejoy Comet, and it flies by uh, once every you know long, long period of time. But if you haven't seen any images of it, and if you didn't get outside to take a look, uh, go and find one. It's absolutely amazing. There's an image taken from an astronaut inside the International Space Station, and this is just so cool, seeing a comet fly by the Earth from outer space space and then you've got the little rainbow pattern created by the Earth's atmosphere colouring it in as well. It's absolutely amazing. And the second thing that I'm going to plug this week <laughs> is <laughs> uh, a new podcast that's coming out. So I've been uh, irritated for the last year and a bit, I guess, uh, because of the lack of a decent physics podcast that's been out there. Um, I'm a physics nerd, as some of our physics, as some of our <laughs> listeners will probably have picked really? up by now. Uh, so myself and a number of other physicists have got together, and we're starting FizCast, which is the global physics podcast, and it'll feature me chatting with some of the more interesting physicists from around the world, and from some local physicists as well, and just to discuss papers and awesome physics. We'll be going into a wee bit more detail than things like TOSP do, uh, but it's all and good fun and uh, keep an eye on Cyblogs for more information about that hell yeah other than that Amy I think that's pretty much it from us for this week yes so it remains to uh, close out uh, as always please do check as I said the blog post that accompanies this um, we are available on iTunes do feel free to rate us it helps if we've got some idea of how we're doing and, and you know whether anybody's listening at all um, it's it's quite nice we're also available on uh, New Zealand's Zilm TV which feeds through to interactive Sony TVs in the country um, we've got a YouTube channel that we at least marginally attempt to, to watch and keep updated um, Elf. And you can, you can also find us and other quality science podcasts at sciencepodcasters.org. Uh, and a big thanks to State Shirt and Rian Xian for our opening and closing themes, respectively, and to Cyblogs and Cybloggers for providing us with stories, discussion topics, and generally making us laugh. And of course, if you've got any, uh, sorry, sorry go I was going to say, and of course, to our listeners, such as they are, for, for listening, uh, do spread the word and get back to us with comments, criticisms, questions, stuff you'd like us to explain or follow up, anything like that. Indeed, and you can, again, you can follow Cyblogs by subscribing to emails or Twitter or RSS or anything else just by visiting the Cyblogs homepage at cyblogs.co.nz and you can follow Amy and myself specifically on Twitter mm -hmm. uh, via our handles or via our Cyblogs. Otherwise, from Amy and myself and another week, stay curious. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>